week uh, with God's Word. I'm going to start. And you know, here we have an expression. Pastor always says to us, don't be new, be known. And so I want to encourage you, even online, even in, as part of our online community, be known. Go into the comment section. Uh, tell us where you're watching from, where you're joining us from, and start to get to know one another. Because re regardless of where we live or, or kind of how we're able to connect in in this season of life, it is so good to do it in community. We need other people. We need encouragement. We need support. We need sometimes people just cheering us on. And of course, sometimes we need prayer. And so we do have a digital prayer card that you can fill in. It's at our website, myhomechurch.ca. There's a button there that just says, uh, need prayer. And you can fill that in and the team will, will agree with you, will pray with you, will stand with you because we honestly believe that we serve a God who hears us, who cares about us and is, is ready for a miracle for each and every one of us. And, and of course, there's so many things going on that we want to let you know about. Uh, the first one is next Sunday, we're having our HC United and it's at our Olds Mountain View location. So if you live in central Alberta, I want to encourage you just to decide right now that you're going to go down there uh, and, and just take that in and we're actually doing two service times that week uh, just to make sure that we have space for everybody so one service is at 5 and another one is at uh, 6 30 so take one of those two in if you live in the Red Deer area we are going to carpool so we're going to meet here at the church and the first one um, is going to leave I think it it's first one's at 5 so we're going to leave here at 4 the second one is going to leave here at 5 30. So if you want a carpool, uh, you're going, man, I'd like to go, but I want, don't want to drive by myself. Meet us here in the church parking lot and we'll, we'll drive all up together. And uh, the other thing that we want to let you know about is we are starting a new series and we are so excited about it. It's called our Chill Dad Campaign. And it was birthed out of Pastor Jakin's heart this summer. And really what we're doing in all of this is we are strengthening and equipping families and especially men. We want men to know that God loves them. He has a plan for them. We want to equip them to lead well in their workplaces, lead well at home, lead well in the church. And it's going to be a lot of fun. You're not going to want to miss it. So, hey, I don't know where you are joining us from, but I want to encourage you, start thinking, you know, what, what men in my world could I start inviting? And maybe I could have a watch party in my community. Maybe I could invite some families into my home on a Sunday morning and we could we could watch this together we could worship together we could hear the word together we could start reaching our community together because you know that's really what it's all about isn't it it's about loving God, getting to know Him, but then, uh, you know, Pastor Lori said it so well while she was here this weekend, it's all about populating heaven and plundering hells. I wanna, just wanted to give you that so you could start prepping, going, okay, who could we pull uh, alongside us? How can we make the most out of this? And of course, we just wanna say, we appreciate each and every one of you. We wanna connect with you. We wanna help you grow in your faith. And so however we can do that, fill in a prayer card, fill in a connection card, one of the team will reach out to you and uh, we are so honored today we have our pastor's pastor pastor Lori and uh, her husband Joe of course our, our pastors to pastors Jake and Becca and she's been here all weekend at our women's conference which was over the top it was absolutely amazing if you didn't get a chance to be here I want to encourage you start planning now for next year uh, that registration is already open on the events.myhomechurch.ca so you could sign up now to make sure you don't miss next year and yeah she has an incredible word for us you're going to be inspired you're going to be challenged and God has a message for each and every one of us so I want to encourage us why don't you wherever you are just open up your heart uh, stand to your feet if you're able and let's give God our absolute best here we go i uh -huh. 
kingdom birds in the color at the speed of light. Sing freedom. Freedom, shaking up the atmosphere. As the shadows fade into nothing as the day appears. Be honest, guys, come on. Be honest, guys, above. Love reaching out for us. The everlasting one. Jesus, our God. Oh, we look to the sun. Set our eyes on the Savior.
whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the the same thing for me Oh God, my God, I need you Oh God, my God, I need you And now How I need you And now Oh rock, oh rock of ages I'm standing on your 
we've been singing about how he's the same God. In fact, today I was reading in Hebrews how he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the healer then. He's the healer now. He's the provider then. He's the provider now. And I just want to just ask, if you have a prayer request in the house, would you just lift up your hand for a moment? We want to come into agreement with you for what you're believing God for today. Maybe there's someone near you that you could just join with. And even even as their hand is up, maybe just put your hand up on their wrist and just kind of hold on to them for a minute. But Lord, as we come into your house today, we put our hope and faith in Jesus Christ. 
We put our hope and faith in the blood of Jesus. We put our hope and faith in the healing power of Jesus. We put our hope and faith in a God that's provided then and provides now. And Father, with every hand that is raised, we just declare miracles on every body, in every house, in every life. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you're doing a work in our lives. And Lord, there might even be some here that are just starting in faith. And Lord, you're leading and guiding them and they're taking steps. Father, I thank you that you're stepping and walking with them as they take this path and journey. We give you thanks for it today. And we give you all the praise for what you're doing and what you're going to do in Jesus' name. And all together we all said, Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together. Hi everyone, as we prepare to give today, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's given and taken this huge step of faith with us. I know on the screen is some of the picture of the building that's being built right now, drone footage, and it is the most spectacular, amazing building being built right now in our region. I wanna thank you to giving towards that, but also just your tithes and offerings to keep the church strong. And honestly, it means the world to Beck and I that you're taking a step of faith with us as we take this huge step of faith together as a church. And today, as we receive tithes and offerings, I want to read a couple of scriptures to you. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 30. That's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. And they don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly take care of you. Why do you have so little faith? And then, of course, verse 33, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. In Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, I don't know about you, but if you're listening to the voices that are in our world today, many of them are negative voices. And you're watching the news and you hear words like inflation or just inflation, a Canadian thing. Uh, or you hear recession, or you hear interest rates, or you hear filling your car with gas, or heating your house, and you hear about all the rising costs. Well, I got some good news for you. The good news for you is you have a Father. You have a God that is your source. You have a supply that's more than on this world. It's a supply from heaven where it says that my God shall supply your need according to his riches in glory. And this is a wonderful truth that if we put God first, all these things will be added to us. And I just want to encourage you not to fear or not to worry. Your God will supply. You don't need to worry and seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you no matter what's going on in your world personally or in the world you can put your trust in God today and so as you give give in faith give with trust uh, give with a sense that God's for me not against me and my life has a great future and so I want to pray for you as you give I know all the ways to give are on the screens and I want to thank you for being part of strengthening God's kingdom financially father thank you for every person that's watching this Lord as we give to you thank you that we can simply trust in you and even lean into you knowing that you are good knowing that you supply knowing that you take care of your kids, you take care of us. Even more than the birds in the air, more than the lilies in the field. And Father, thank you that you supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. We put our trust in you today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for standing with us and giving in this season of time. Hi, 
my name is Shanna. I have been married to my husband, Steve, for 26 years, and together we've raised three now adult children. Uh, we have received some of the best advice about knowing uh, where God was calling us, and it was to look to see where God is moving and join in. So 10 years ago, we moved ourselves to Red Deer and joined Home Church and have made it our home ever since. I was raised in a Christian home uh, and invited to have my own relationship with Jesus when I was four years old. My parents taught me early in life that I really could call on God for anything. And more importantly, they taught me how to listen to God and to say yes when he was calling to me. My dad is a quiet, natured person, but always encouraged me not to be. He would tell me to be brave, to say yes whenever God was calling. He would say things like, start while you're young, so it can be easy when you're older. I grew up in a small town in Newfoundland, a small church called Harvest Time Pentecostal Church. The harvest of soul winning and welcoming revival was always the mission, and that was imparted to me. I felt so at home and so alive whenever I was serving in the church. I always dreamed of one day being a part of a church reaching lots of people. After graduation, I headed to Bible college, and yes, I found my husband there. The years have brought many different seasons of life, some seasons where I felt like I was calling to God more than he was calling on me. Seasons of job loss, financial challenges, losing people to suicide, some of our loved ones caught in addictions, some with mental illness, and some people walking out on us. Those tough seasons, I wondered if I was now disqualified from being called by God, and if God could ever use me. But I remember the service when Pastor Mel told his story of losing his dad to suicide. God spoke to my heart and began to renew my sense of being qualified. I remember thinking, if God can birth a worldwide church from a man whose family was devastated by suicide, then maybe there's still something for me. I knew it was time for me to start making my troubles work for me and to bring God glory. So I signed up for a course with Pastor Melanie to make my heart whole again. I joined the team serving here at Celebrate Recovery two years ago when it began, and now I get to help people write their testimonies. I lead a support group downtown Red Deer for caregivers of mentally ill loved ones. I have received so much, so much more than the love that I give. I've received healing through serving. This past January, God called to my heart again and it was loud, I found myself daydreaming often of what I could do better to help move the vision of the church forward. So maybe when I retire, I thought. As Pastor Jakin preached an anointed redream series in January, I felt the passion and the energy come back into my spirit like I had when I was a teenager for serving in God's house. It all came alive. I knew I couldn't wait another 20 years until I retired to start serving more. I was at a prayer meeting one Monday night, and I heard the call of God again. He was inviting me, asking me if I would help uncover acres of diamonds that God had been forming in this place, in this season, helping people find their place, helping them find their talents to be brought forward, to be stewarded in the house. So today I'm serving here to help others find their place, and I believe it's time for all of us to discover or unhide our calling and to bring that treasure to the house. What will you bring as we get ready for the greatest days of harvest? Don't disqualify yourself from the calling God has for you and don't wait any longer to uncover it. Say yes to what God is calling you to do. I want to welcome those who are joining us online. It is so awesome. Can you welcome everybody with me today? I'm super excited to be a part of this new series or the end of the series. I'm going to be the, not the alpha, but the omega of the series, the invitation. And um, I also just want to reciprocate my deep love and affection and admiration for your pastors, Pastor Jacob and Pastor Becca, and also Pastor Mel and Pastor Heather. Um, give it up for them. There is, 
no church, no pastors closer to our heart than this church, these pastors. Um, I just, I really do feel like I'm coming home. This is my second home and um, appropriately called home church. And I don't know if my earrings are going to bother my, let's try this, it's girl preacher problems right here. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Um, But I feel like I've watched your kids grow up. I haven't aged until I come here and I see the Mullins kids. (laughs) And then I see my kids. If you could throw a photo um, of my kids. We've been a part of this church and the extended family of this church. Yes, I'll move out of the way. But um, our son Connor in the middle got married over the summer. So we have... The three boys, of course, the handsome man in the, in the center, my husband, Joe, which I've made him stay home this time since I had to stay home last time. And now we have added two girls to our lives, um, Caroline and Reagan. And so um, they send their love to all of you. But I can tell you, speaking of this um, series, The Invitation, in the last six years, we have given and sent out a lot of invitations. We have had two weddings, we've had about six graduations from high school, from college, we've had showers, we've had, you can, you can pull that down, I'm, I'm, I'm good with them, I think y'all see them. But, um, and the invitation, especially to a wedding, is a thing. It turns a bride into a bridezilla, it turns a groom into a groomzilla. There is the planning of the wedding and then there is this thing they don't tell you about and that is the invitation. Because you know you have to settle in on how many people and when you have a church the size of ours and also our kids have married girls with big families, it is hard because there are the must the must invitations, there are the invitations that you want to send, and there are the invitations that you send and hope they don't come, but give a good, good <laughs> gift. Is that true? And so, um, fortunately, two of my kids have been married and had destination weddings, or destination from Texas weddings, and so that has made my life a lot easier, but... Um, We're talking about the invitation of God to us tonight. And I can tell you that you were not on the backup plan of the invitation, but you were on the must invitation. He needs you, he wants you, he wants you to to come into your purpose. I think about um, all the times that God calls people, like Romans 8, 28 says, he calls us according to purpose. He doesn't butt dial us. He calls us according to purpose for a purpose. And Jesus encountered all of these people in his life and in his ministry, but he encountered this woman who became the greatest evangelist of all times, and he found her at a well and he told her about her life, and he invited her into purpose, and as a result, she invited a whole city into their purpose. Because an invitation from God is never meant to stop with you. An invitation from God is meant to start a chain reaction in your life. And so that's what I want to entitle this message tonight, is the power of an invitation to a chain reaction. The law of physics says that every action causes a reaction. Same laws in the United States. (laughs) And I believe that there's a city in you. I believe that there's a family in you. I believe there's a neighborhood in you, a school in you, a workplace in you. There's a purpose in you. And I wanna talk about a very simple woman who didn't have all the pedigrees behind her name or the doctorates of seminary or whatever, but she was called into purpose. And it's um, a woman called the Shunammite woman, and it's in 2 Kings chapter 4, if you want to go with me in your Bible. Lord Jesus, just like the lovely lady on screen said tonight, we say yes to your invitation. We lean into your word tonight. We lean into your presence, Lord God, in this place today, Lord Jesus. Use us. And we say yes in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. When my kids were little, we used to read this story called, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. Have you ever heard of that story? Somebody in the room is just like, please read the story. 
but it's an awesome story because um, the quick version is when you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to be thirsty and he's going to ask you for a glass of milk. And when you give him a glass of milk, he's going to ask you for a straw. And when you give him a straw, he's going to ask you for a napkin to clean his mustache. And when he cleans his mustache, he's going to see that his mustache needs to be trimmed. So he's going to ask you for a scissors. And then when you, he gets the scissors and you trim the mustache, of course there's going to be mustache hairs on the floor. He's going to ask for a broom. He's going to be so worked up. He's gotten his hunger back and he wants another cookie. And then he wants another glass of milk. And it starts with a cookie and it ends with a cookie and there's this chain reaction and there's a chain reaction in this passage today. It says in verse eight, and we're gonna read a lot of scripture. One day Elisha went to the town of Shunem and a wealthy woman, most, most translations say a great woman because she was more than wealthy. She also had wisdom, she had influence. She had, she was, she had respect of people. She lived there and she urged him to come to her house for a meal. And after that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband one day, I'm sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he'll have a place to stay whenever he comes by. And her husband went along with her thinking that she'd watch too much home TV and renovation shows. And one day Elisha turned to Shunem and he went up to this upper room to rest. And he said to his servant Gehazi, tell the one from Shunem, I wanna speak to her. And when she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, not to her, he starts speaking in front of her. Tell her, we appreciate the kind concern that she has shown to us, what can we do for you, can we put a good word in for you to the king or to the commander of the army? And she says, no, my family takes good care of me. And later Elisha asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man. You can read through the lines on that one. (laughs) The truth is the Shunammite woman had everything on the outside, but she'd had many negative pregnancy tests. She had this hidden desire in her heart that she was either too afraid or didn't want to be disappointed or just didn't think she was worthy of asking this man of God for what he could secure for her. And Elisha said to her, she stood in the doorway, next year at this time you will be holding a son in your arms. And she says, no, my Lord, oh man of God, don't deceive me. Don't get my hopes up. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. Fast forward, her son is older and he went out to help his father who's working with the harvesters. And suddenly he cried out, my head hurts, my head hurts. And his father did what some of my my husband would probably do. He was like, go go to your mom, go tell your mom. (laughs) So the servant took him home and his mother held him in her lap. And about that time in the afternoon, he died. Up until that point, everything was going so well. Prayers that she hadn't even prayed were being answered. It was just a miracle. She has this son. And then all of a sudden, the request that she never had, the miracle that she never dared ask for, dies in her lap. And she carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. Then she shut the door and left him. And she sent a message to her husband. And she said, I'm going on an errand. And he says, why today? And he couldn't figure it out. And she goes, it'll be all right. She didn't even want to take the time to tell him. So she saddled the donkey and she said to the servant, hurry, don't slow down unless I tell you. And as she approached the man of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw her in the distance. And he said, Gehazi, look, the women of Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her if everything is all right. And she's like, I don't want to talk to you. Take me to Elisha. And she did. And he said, She said, did I ask you for a son? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and don't get my hopes up? And Elisha said, get ready to travel. She's like, oh, no, no, no. He's not traveling with me. You're traveling with me. And Elisha knew not to argue with this woman. 
Don't argue with the mama on a mission. <laughs> so Gehazi went ahead and Elisha went with her. And Gehazi hurried on, laid the staff on the child's face and nothing happened. And when Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying there in the prophet's bed. He went in alone, shut the door behind him, prayed to the Lord. Then he laid down on the child's body, placing his mouth, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And as he stretched out on the child, the body began to grow warm. And Elisha got back up, walked back and forth across the room, stretched himself out again on this child. And this time, the boy sneezed seven times. I think he was in Texas because we have very bad allergies. And then he prayed again. And Elisha summoned Gehazi, called the child's mom. And he said, she came in. Here, take your son. She fell at his feet, bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. Then she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. There is a whole lot of story in these 29 verses that I want to encourage you out of, but it starts in a room and it ends in a room. And this started with an invitation to dinner. And then all of a sudden, this couple is like, you know what? Dinner isn't enough. We actually need to build a room for this guy. And so then it was a room, and then it was a bed, and then it was a table, and then it was a lamp. And before you know it, God started to work in miraculous ways because of an invitation. And I would imagine that this lady and her husband were having some kind of pillow talk at night and as he was dozing off, she was like, what if we add a story to our house? Wow. And when she started thinking about building a story, God began to build a story in their lives. So you see, you're building a building, but it's not just a building. It's a place of stories as you're adding a story. And that's a tall building, that's a lot of stories. There's a lot of stories that are gonna come out of that. Amen. Stories are contagious. The best thing about this room is that I can look around and I can watch the video that we just watched and I can be encouraged in my faith because of the stories that are in this room. And if I'm not here, and if I'm not watching, then I don't get the benefit of your story to encourage me in my story. And I wanna talk about four actions or invitations in your life that will produce a chain reaction. And you can apply it to your life, you can apply it to your home, you can apply it to this church. The first action is to take, take God home with you. You know, she wasn't just building this room for any man. She was building this room for a man who represented the presence of God. This man would come to her house and he wasn't just, you know, talking about de decorations or football or hockey or whatever. He was talking about the things of God. He was, she was welcoming faith into her, into her house. She was welcoming the sound of prayer into her house. And three sounds that we need in our house is first the sound of prayer. I was a teenage girl and I've always been an expressive worshiper since I was a little bitty girl. And one day I looked around, I saw all the other teenagers and they were standing there like bumps in a log, but they looked really cool and I didn't look so cool. And so I thought, I'm gonna be cool like them one day. And so I decided that I was not gonna sing. I was not gonna lift my hands. I wasn't gonna clap. I wasn't gonna do any of that stuff. I was just gonna be cool that day. Well, it was, it was the most boring Sunday of my whole life. <laughs> And I was like, I cannot sustain cool. But that night, went home, went to sleep, woke up in the middle of the night to get a glass of water. And I hear my dad, and he is walking, he's pacing the floors, and he is praying, oh God, don't let my daughter's heart go cold. Don't let my daughter backslide. And I thought, I didn't even backslide, I just didn't clap. <laughs> But my dad knew in that moment that my friends were having too much influence in my life. And because he was a man of prayer, he was a man that could get in touch with God. And he was a man that I was like, I can't even backslide in this house. Because this is a house where the sound of prayer is always happening. 
We need the sound of God's word in our house. Your kids need to wake up and find you in the word of God. They need to catch you studying the word. Also, when you're watching TV, just press pause and say, this is what the Bible says about that. We call it along the way devotionals. It's, it's out of this Deuteronomy 6. It says, in these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk around, when you lie down, when you rise up. All the time, we don't have family devotionals, but we live a devoted family life where when we are not afraid to address the situations that culture is having, attack our kids. They are attacking our kids, the friends, the the feelings, all of that stuff. We're like, what does the word of God say about that? Not your friends, not your feelings, not your culture, not the news, not Instagram. But if you're not showing and letting them read the word and talking through that, That's the presence of God in your house. You know, a lot of times people, they just leave God at church. They just leave God at church on the weekends, like they have weekend visitation rights or something, like you had a divorce and you know, once a week you get to see your kids on the weekend. It's, that's not how it is. He wants us to take him home. He wants to abide with us. He wants to live with us. He wants to walk with us. He wants to encourage us in our daily life. And the third sound is the sound of praise and worship. Amen. I look at um, Pastor Jake and Pastor Becca's kids. It's not because they worship once a week. When I see them worship, I think about me when I was that age worshiping God because there was a sound of the presence of God. It says he inhabits the praises of his people. We need an environment shift, especially in the days that we're living in, that there are so many noises and so many sounds coming against us. I remember when my kids were little and they were a little bit too quiet and I walked into a bedroom and I saw them little two little boys with buzz cuts and they're jumping up and down singing take 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 it all take 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 it all and I will never forget the sound of surrender and that sound of surrender that time of worship the presence of God it sticks in your memory and it's carried them through their life into the purpose of God for their life we have to have the sound of worship The second action that we need is to be generous towards God. She never knew that the place she sacrificed for would be the place where her son would be resurrected. She never even knew there would be a son to be resurrected. The Shunammite woman wasn't giving to get, but God has a giving plan. Malachi, it says, that we can test God in our giving that he will open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing so great that we will not have enough room to take it in. Do you know why he says to give your tithes and your offerings to the storehouse? You know why we have a building that we're building, not just because we need another building in Red Deer, but we need another testimony in Red Deer. We need a place that's not just a building, but it's a place where dead kids are raised to life. It's a place where dead marriages are raised to life. You know, I have not been the wisest according to the world with my investments, but one thing that I invested in over and over and over again is the house of God. And guess what? I'm not talking as a pastor today. I'm talking as a mom today because my kids were saved in the very house I built with my generosity. My neighbors have been saved. People on the playground have been saved. My kids' friends have been saved because I invested. They weren't gonna show up on an empty lot. They weren't gonna show up in the library that we started in. We had to make a room for them so that they could experience a living God. Right on. Number three, the third action is don't settle when you're suffering. We're all going to go through suffering at some point. This woman could have settled for not having a son. 
because she either didn't invite, want to invite disappointment into her life or she didn't want to impose on God. I don't know why people don't ask God for things, but there's a plethora of reasons sometimes we don't think God would care enough. But after her son died, it says, so she saddled the donkey and said to the servant, hurry, don't slow down unless I tell you to. You know, she got on a donkey and she got bossy. (laughs) She could have thrown herself on the floor and nobody would have blamed her. But she didn't settle in her suffering. She didn't take it. She would not allow disappointment in God to keep her from a relationship with God. She would not allow death to make her distant. David found himself suffering and I've encouraged myself with this scripture verse so many times, whether it's in a time of lack or it's a time of difficulty or a time of betrayal or just a time of disappointment in some area of my life. And it says in Psalm 27, I would have lost heart unless I had believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. She made a decision not allow, to allow herself to stay in the dead places, but to believe that no matter what she was experiencing, that she would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. living. That she knew that the goodness of God was, was bigger and better than her biggest disappointment, her biggest struggle, her biggest loss. And our theology of the goodness of God needs to be in us before we go through difficult times. Because it's not if, it's when. When life doesn't go as planned, we draw from God. I was diagnosed with cancer when I was 23 years old and I was seven months pregnant with my first child. And um, that night I was diagnosed, but they couldn't do all the staging. They just said, you do have a malignant tumor and we don't know how far it's progressed or whatever, but it was on a Wednesday, April 16th, 1992. And my husband was 27 years old. And he was assigned to preach that night. He was a youth pastor. He was assigned to preach to the whole church that night. And he preached on healing that night. Wow. He preached on healing before we knew if I was in stage one or stage four. Because he was like, God is a healer, whether he heals Lori on this side of earth or on the other side, he's still a healer. And God is still a redeemer, and God is still faithful, and he's still a provider. Like Pastor Jacob said today, he said, he is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He is still good. And sometimes when you're in the middle of your darkest day, all you need to mutter out is, God, you are good. God, you are the same. The character of God does not change when our conditions change. He is constant in this crazy world. He is consistent and we can put our hope in him. Number four, don't allow the miracle to stop with you. This is the really good part that nobody tells you about in this story, but the greatest miracle in our lives is the miracle of salvation, but you aren't, you aren't made to be a one miracle hit wonder. I mean, anybody would have said, like having, your, having a barren woman produce a child with an old man and then the child dies, and then he's resurrected, you're like, okay, you're, you're good on the miracles. Like, you have had enough miracles. Like, let the, God share the miracles with other people. But that was only in chapter four. Fast forward to chapter eight. Her son has grown. We think her husband has died. There's a famine. She finds out about it from God. She moves away. All of her possessions are taken away from her. She comes back. She goes before the king. Supernaturally, she happens to show up when Elisha is there. And he's like, yeah, I know this woman. Like, she has a past. And she demands her land back. And she was restored every single thing. She kept serving God. A lot of times... We get a miracle from God 
and we go on our merry way. She kept serving God. She kept hearing from God that she was supposed to get out of this place and get out of the famine and go, go somewhere that, where she can eat. And she goes back, she gets a restoration, she gets another miracle. In fact, theologians say this woman had more miracles than anyone else in the entire Bible. And we don't even know her name. <laughs> the Shunammite woman. The Shunammite woman. You don't have to have a big name to have a big God. You don't have to have a big name to have a big purpose. You don't have to have a big name to be used in a big way. For God to see who you are and see where you are. God uses messy stories. A lot of us are waiting for our story to be perfect and polished. And God uses messy stories. When I was struggling with cancer, I went to church, a little bitty church that my dad had pastored. And there was a woman there who barely opened her mouth. She was the shyest human being I've ever known. But she'd had the same cancer as me in stage four, when she was four months pregnant, the doctor said there's no way her child would live. She went through all this chemotherapy, all this stuff. The child is now probably 35 years old, living to this day. And every time I showed up to the house of God, I just looked for her story. A few years before I got cancer, I was a teenage girl and I was sitting on the front row and my dad, who was 45 years old, dropped out of a heart attack while he was preaching. And I can't tell you the havoc that wreaked on our family. Three teenage kids, 12 to 19 years old, my mom, 39 years old. He was preaching on healing that day, by the way. And the enemy wanted to take away our story and to say like, the church has hurt you. Look, your dad was preaching on healing and he died right in the middle. And what are you gonna do? And God's abandoned you and your dad, you don't have a dad. And I remember continuing to show up in the house of God and looking for people who had lost a loved one and going, they're smiling again. You don't have to be on a platform to tell a story. You have to show up. You have to worship God despite maybe going through a divorce or addiction or having somebody betray you or whatever. Because Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good to those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. Not all things are good, but give God time and give God your story and give God your worship before you even feel like it. And I promise you, He is gonna work it out for your good and it's gonna have a chain reaction for other people's good too. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Can you surrender your story to God today? Can you give God your life that may seem messy, but He wants it to be miraculous? Lord Jesus, you see the people in this room. You see the hands open up to you in this room, Lord God. And I just pray, Lord, that you would take whatever has happened in their lives, whatever has produced pain, and you would produce purpose. We thank you, Lord God, that you pull purpose out of us so that we can pull purpose out of others. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Let's stand to our feet this evening. Wasn't that an incredible message tonight? Come on, let's put our hands together and thank Pastor Lori for that incredible message. Before we take a few minutes and, and worship and just really um, give our story to God, um, there's the greatest story ever told. And it's the story that God loved us so much that He sent His one and only Son, that whoever would believe in Him would have eternal life. With every eye closed in the house today, you're here and you say, I'm just, I'm not right with God. You're watching online, you say, I'm not right with God. 
the greatest story is that God sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you and for I so that we could have life and our story could change. We would be changed because of what Jesus has done. And you're here and you say, Pastor, I just need to get right with God. Would you be bold enough to let me pray with you today? Would you be bold enough just to lift up your hand, even those online, just lift up your hand where you are. And if you're here and you say, I want to I wanna pray a prayer, would you just lift up your hand where you are and say, I'm not right with God, but I want to I wanna be made right with God today. Awesome. Church family, can we put our hands up as well? And let's pray this prayer and say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you gave your life for me. Thank you that your story becomes my story and your life becomes my life. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tune. I come to you. Thank you for making me right in your eyes, in your sight, through what you've done. I give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And how many of you just feel like this message, like just giving your story to God tonight? Come on, let's lift our hands. And even as you lift up your hand, it's just your life. You're lifting up your story. You're lifting up your life to Him. You're surrendering. You're saying, yes, God. Yes, God. I'm giving you this story. As you're putting your hands up, you're putting a betrayal in the hands of Jesus. You're putting a hard thing in the hands of Jesus. You're, you're putting a difficulty. You're putting a sickness in the hands of Jesus. You're putting a trial in the hands of God today. And you're saying, yes, I'll answer. Who am I that you love me? Who am I that you save my soul? Who am I without you, Lord? think we should just put our hands together and just thank God. Just thank Him for His Word to you tonight. Thank Him for His goodness to you. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to pray the blessing over you tonight. May the Lord bless you and keep you. His face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. May lift His countenance towards you and give you His peace. In Jesus' name and the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Christ, make sure you head over to myhomechurch.ca. There is a button that literally says, I said yes to Jesus. We would love to hear from you. Listen, have the best week this week. Join us at one of our live services. Find a location right on our website, or we'll see you right here next weekend.